Hey and welcome to Light Church. It's Sunday morning and you are joining us for our virtual gathering. Yeah, however you found us, whether you're watching for the very first time or you've been with us for a long time, we are so excited you decided to join us this morning. Yeah, we are. And if you want to connect with us, head to light.church forward slash connect. And if at any point during the service you need prayer, head to light.church forward slash prayer. Yeah, coming up this morning, I'm so excited to introduce one of my really good friends, Temi Tewo, all the way from Hackney Church in East London. Temi is the young adults and youth pastor over there, so I'm so excited for all that he's going to bring today. Yeah, I'm excited. It's going to be good. But maybe you've got someone a little bit younger in your household. Well, don't worry. Our amazing kids ministry, Epic, have videos in store for all the kids 11 and under. So if you want to head to Light Church, Epic Online over on YouTube, um, you'll find thousands of videos. Okay, maybe not thousands. Thousands, but quite a few videos for them to get involved in. They've got great teaching, fun games, and lots of songs. So make sure your kids are checking that out. So I just want to bring a little bit of a focus before we jump into some worship. There'll be a little 30 second gap. Uh, Holly can tell you what to do in that 30 seconds. But I want to read a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. It's from the message version. And it says, so we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on us. But on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without His unfolding grace. And I want to encourage you, things might around you might look dead crazy. Things might look confusing. And on the outside, life might just look like it's falling apart. But can I encourage you, God can be doing something on the inside of you. Right in the middle of this crazy time, I believe God can bring about new life. So this morning, can I encourage you to take your eyes off the situation around us and start asking God, what do you want to do within me? And God's going to use you to change the situation around you and to work in you as he begins to change things around you. So I'm so excited. Don't miss this moment this morning. So 30 seconds. Yes. What can we do? Uh, you can share this video with a friend. You can grab yourself another coffee. Um, you can make a coffee for the person sat next to you if you're watching with someone. I remind um, you that on Sunday. <laughs> um, if you're watching with someone. But take this 30 seconds to prepare yourself as we go into worship. Left for dead in your wake 
You crashed those age-old gates You left no stone unturned You stepped out of that grave You showed them me on the way home So here I stand, I surrender I need you now Hold my heart now and forever My soul cries out Here I stand, I surrender I need you now Hold my heart now and forever My soul cries out Here I stand, I surrender me now healed and forgiven look where my chains are now death has no hold on me cause your grace holds that ground and your grace holds me now your grace holds me now Grace holds me now. Grace holds me now. So here I stand, I surrender. I need you now. Hold my heart now and forever. My soul cries out. Here I stand. Surrender, I need you now Hold my heart now and forever My soul cries out Once I was broken But you loved my whole heart through Sin has no hold on me Cause your grace holds me now I run to the Father, I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend So I run to the Father again and again and again and again Oh I run to the Father, I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend So I run to the Father again and again and again and again Oh I run to the Father, I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend So I run to the Father again and again and again and again Oh, oh, again my heart has been in your sights Long before my first breath Running into your arms It's running to life from death And I feel this rush deep in my 
chest Your mercy is calling out Just as I am Oh, you pull me in And I know I need you now I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait My heart needs a searcher My soul needs a friend And so I run to the Father Again and again and again and again Oh, oh, again and again It's a bit of a cliche, I know, but I think after the year we've just had, it's safe to say that sometimes you don't know what you've got until it's gone. The meeting place, that symbol of hope and home, a space for possibilities and a source of inspiration was closed for us and many for almost a year. For some people, it's the only form of human connection they have all week. For others, it's a chance to catch up, to worship, to seek help, and to be together. So shutting the doors meant we had to work hard. It meant we had to bring people together in some other ways. We had to innovate, to be creative, to facilitate that all-important human connection. We quickly engaged our community online, forged stronger bonds with the local council, and listened to what the community needed, both locally and in some cases, globally. We have felt the effect that isolation has had on people, but we also felt the power of human connection and resilience, that warm glow of a united community. Countless volunteers, hundreds of hours, thousands of people helped. For years now, we've been hiring spaces. We've been relying upon bookings and venue availability. We've been at full capacity and not had any space to grow into. For years, we've been praying for a place of our own. We've been drawing up plans, securing funding, but not found anywhere we can put our plans into action. The last year the world has changed, and we've adapted, and we've embraced possibility, and we're committed more than ever to serving our community, to building on the connections we've made, to push the learnings we've found into a new territory, and to craft a space to allow people to flourish. Light Church is for anyone and everyone. We want to help people step into their future, we want to be able to have a place to call home. And now we have that opportunity. Some land has become available, and not just any land, prime real estate, right in the middle of the community, at the heart of the Fylde Coast. We've drawn up plans, we have some of the money for the build, but we need your help to secure the land. This isn't just about bricks and mortar. This is about hope. This is about future. It's a chance to lay down some foundations, to build a community space, to create a permanent presence, a venue for innovation, to serve now and empower future generations. This is more than just Sundays. This is more than just us. Well, hello, Light Church and everyone online. I'm super, super stoked to be speaking to you all today. My name is Temi Tope Stephen Taiwo, but you can call me Temi. And I'm the young adults and youth pastor here at Hackney Church in East London. Our building, actually, that I'm standing in today, I'm in one of our rooms, has been here since 1270. Five. So this building has been an iconic center of Christian worship in our community. 
Uh, I, I've actually only been here since uh, September 2020, but I'm so privileged to be playing, uh, I'm so privileged to be playing my part in our vision here, which is to see a renaissance through restoring lives, revitalizing churches, and renewing culture in Jesus' name. Uh, I, although I only moved to East London recently, uh, I was born in South London in Lewisham. Uh, and when I was around two years old or so, I moved over to Enfield in North London. So as you can tell, I'm a Londoner through and through. I'm also an Arsenal supporter. And this season has taught me patience, long suffering and pain. But <laughs> I'm not going to preach on that today. Although I could speak on the spirituality of being a football supporter, that could definitely preach. Well, like church, uh, when Pastor Dan actually asked me to speak, I was super surprised, if I'm being honest, because we were just having a, a guy-to-guy -guy chat. And, you know, we were catching up about life. Uh, we were talking about our vision for the church, our, our love for God's family, like what we see happening in our culture. And it was actually off the back of that conversation that Pastor Dan said, hey, Temi, I would love if you would speak at one of our February dates. And I was like, dude, of course, I would love to, man. I love everything that's happening at Light Church. Uh, hashtag more than Sundays. The creativity that is coming out of you guys, the, the worship songs, it's, it's incredible. And so I said, hey, I would absolutely love to speak to your congregation. But if I'm being honest, I was a bit surprised. I was a bit surprised. But the more, the more I thought about it afterwards, I was like, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised. Um, maybe I shouldn't have questioned it. And it's not because I'm an amazing speaker or anything like that, but the more I, I think about the kingdom of God, the more I understand is that's actually how it grows. You see, the kingdom of God grows on relational lines. And we actually see this in all of scripture. Uh, if you take John 19, for example, our savior, Jesus is on the cross. And it's his time of pain and separation. Some of his friends have abandoned him. Peter has denied him three times. And whilst on the cross, Jesus turns to his mother, Mary, and he says, woman, uh, uh, by the way, don't call your mother woman. I haven't tried it myself because I, I like my life. But in those days, the word woman would have been a respectful term. So Jesus is on the cross and he, and he looks at his, his mother Mary and he says, woman here, referring to John, his, his disciple, here is your son. Uh, and he says to John, here, referring to Mary, is your mother. And so we see that even at Jesus's a time of separation and pain, a time of excruciating pain and perhaps even some, some forms of embarrassment maybe, Jesus is still concerned for family, for relationship. And so this is why, well, this is one of the reasons why I love the Bible so much. Because in the Bible, we see the relationship of God unfolding with us, but particularly in the book of Genesis, because in the book of Genesis, that's the origins of God's relationship with humanity and humanity's relationship with one another. And so today, actually, I'm going to be using the book of Genesis to share this word, which is really, really on my heart. And so in the next 25 minutes or so, I hope to take us on a journey. Uh, and on this journey, we're going to have three points. Uh, number one, we're going to start with the book of Genesis. And we're going to look at Adam and Eve's story, the, the fall of humanity. And then we're going to look at Cain's story. Cain was their son and his fall, if you like, uh, when Cain murdered his brother Abel. And so we're going to contrast these two narratives of Adam and Eve and Cain, and we're going to learn something. We're going to learn uh, two things, I think, actually, something about the nature of God and something about the consequences of sin. Then secondly, we're going to fast forward about a thousand years, and we're going to look at how the consequences of sin are still apparent in our society today. 
And then lastly, I'm going to round it all together again. Uh, and I'm going to speak to how we and how you, like church, can still show a compelling alternative in today's society. And brief. <laughs> Uh, I know it sounds like a lot, but it's going to be amazing. It's going to be a breeze. It's going to be really cool. So if you're a note taker like me, uh, then grab your notepad and your pen. If you're an auditory learner, then why don't you pump up that volume We're about to get into it. Today's sermon title is simply The Face of God. The Face of God. Hey, Light Church, would you be so kind to... Pray with me before we continue. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you, God, that even in the midst of a pandemic and the disruption it's caused, we can still connect with you and with one another, even through technology. And Lord, I just pray as I share this word that you would give me grace and strength to to tell of how you look to us, God, and how we too in response can live before your face. Lord, grant me grace today. And the people said, amen. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, um, we're going to actually start with the book of Genesis, and we're going to read Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. And then straight after that, we're going to read Genesis 4, verses 8 to 16. So we're going to contrast Adam and Eve's fall, so after they ate from the tree uh, and they disobeyed God and what happened, and we're going to contrast that with Cain's fall uh, when he disobeyed God uh, and ended up murdering his brother. So let's start in Genesis verses 3, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. I'm sure the words will come up on the screen as well. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man said to his wife, uh, sorry, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where, where are you? And he said, Adam said, I heard the sound of you, God, in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid myself. That's Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. Now we're going to look at Genesis 4, verses 8 to 16. Verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where, where is Abel, your brother? Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what is it that you have done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you, Cain, are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. This is the word of the Lord. So, so, so what is happening in these passages? We already know that there's a similar thing of sin and rebellion and rejection of God's ways. But beyond that, what else is happening in this passage? Well, the first thing that I want to draw our eyes to is the response of God to these two devastating, traumatic events of human history. The original fall and the first murder. If we go back and we look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 9 and, and God's response to Adam, we're going to notice a question. It says, the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? Now, if we contrast this with Cain's story and we read Genesis chapter 4, verse 9, we see something quite similar. 
It says this, the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Where is your brother Abel? So the first thing I want to draw our eyes to is that God's immediate response to both of these traumatic events is to search for man. So from his own actions, we learn something super important, very important, that God has a gaze. And if you're taking notes, that is something to write down. This is absolutely vital. God has a gaze. Now, this has always been something that has really made the early followers of God quite confused even, or even it's made them marvel because how is it that a God who is high and exalted, a God that is beyond and above the heavens and the earth, looks for man? This is why the psalmist in Psalm chapter 8 verses 4 says this, Lord, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? What are human beings that you care for them? You see, there is something quite uh, different, something quite alarming almost of a God, creator of heaven and earth, stooping low to look for the created, the creator looking for the created. It's why the incarnation of Christ, Jesus coming to earth has been such a mystery for scholars and theologians and laymen and people of all generations. In Philippians 2, the Bible tells us that Jesus, even though he was equal with God, did not count that equality something to use to his own advantage, but instead he humbled himself by becoming a man and he became obedient even unto death, death on the cross. You see, this is an astounding truth. It's a mystery. It causes the scholar to cast away his intellect. It causes the sinner to turn away from sin and return home. It's a mystery. You see, God has a gaze. He looks for the lost. He pursues people. God's gaze, the fact that God has a gaze, that God looks for us, therefore helps us in many ways. One of which is that it takes away condemnation, self-condemnation. I, I don't know about you guys, but I know that when, when I became a Christian, I... I I found it really difficult with the whole forgiveness thing. Um, it wasn't so much that I could not believe that God forgave me, but more so that he kind of forgot, in a sense. That he kind of, the Bible says that as far as the East is from the West, I believe that the Lord casts our sins away from us. It's kind of like he just wipes the slate clean. And I, I really struggled with this, if I'm being honest. How is it that God can forget my sins. But the truth is that God does forgive. He restores us. This is what the prophet Zechariah says. He says, the Lord says, return to me and I will return to you. This tells us that the love-filled pursuit of God is relentless, but it does require a response. It requires a response because God is a gentleman. I don't know if you've um, ever learned anything about ballroom dancing, but when it, when it comes to ballroom dancing, there is something called the closed hold, which is how most dances begin. And there's five points um, to beginning this closed hold. The first point is when the gentleman uh, or the man, he will he'll put out his hand, his left hand, and he will wait patiently for the woman to place her right hand into his you wait patiently. And I believe in a more profound way, in a more wonderful way, God does the same. So even though I found it a struggle to believe God's forgiveness, when, once I read my Bible more and more and understood that God has a gaze, it made me understand that God is constantly leaving out his left hand. 
This is why when Adam sins, God says to, to Adam, Adam, where are you? He doesn't say, oh, I can't believe that you've done this and just cast him away and never look at him again. He, he, he stretches out his left hand and he says, where are you? It's why when Cain sins and, and kills his brother Abel and Abel is lying in a pool of blood, God says to Cain, he says, where is Abel, your brother? You see, this is what God does for us too. You might have thought that sin that you committed last week or perhaps that skeleton in your closet that no one knows about is enough to push God away. But instead, God doesn't get, God get pushed away. He comes to you and I and he says, hey, 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 I am calling you home. Will you return? Will you return? So God has a gaze. But returning to the passage of Genesis, we, we actually see something else happening, another parallel at work. If we go to Genesis 3.10, when Adam replies to God's question, this is what he says. God, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Now, I want you to notice something. What happens in Cain's story? After God gives Cain a judgment for the murder, notice what Cain says. Cain said to the Lord, Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. Are you seeing any parallels? Adam's consequence or Adam's response to his sin was to hide himself. Cain's fear was that he would be hidden from the face of God. Now, it's fascinating to me that uh, Cain speaks of the face of God, which is also today's sermon, if you, uh, sermon title, if you didn't already know. You know, I read recently that faces are, are, are like an ever-changing billboard. And it's through faces that we actually begin to learn about one another. He says that, uh, this quote I read, it said that much of what we learn, what, much of what we know uh, about people comes from their faces before they've even spoken a word. You see, faces are deeply important to us as humans. A study that was done in 1975 uh, looked at 40 newborn babies, uh, brand new babies, if you like. They were, the median age was nine minutes. And, and the researchers of this study, Goran, Sati, and Wu, they wanted to know where, whether newborns are able to respond to faces. And so what they did is that they put some pictures of faces uh, up, and they also had some scrambled images and some blank images and they compared the response rate. Now the research showed that there was an overwhelming response to actual faces. This demonstrates that even at such a tender age, even a newborn baby sees something in another person. Now although the, the reasons for this early preference is debated, it does tell us something that we have this thing when it comes to seeing another person, particularly their face. It's no surprise then that the Bible actually speaks of the face of something more. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew expression, his face, would often refer to being in the presence or in front of someone. So if you was in front of his face, you was in front of his face presence. It's why King David in Psalm chapter 27 verse 8 says, Lord, I want to seek your face. In other words, I want to be in your presence. But equally or additionally, the metaphor of, uh, or, or the face acted as a metaphor for light. You see, in the Old Testament, we read of the face uh, is like emanating the presence. It's like when you smile, there was a, a, a sense of light that radiated from your face. And, and today, actually, we still, we still believe this. It's one of the reasons why uh, I know like when my sister would see her friend or something, she would say, hey girl, you're, you're glowing today. 
It's like light radiates from faces when we look healthy and happy. It's actually one of the reasons why in stanza 13 of the poem, The Highwayman, that was written by Alfred Noyes, he writes this line, her face was like light. So the face shines. Faces break out in smiles that flash across our vision. This is why the ultimate blessing uh, it, it is to have the Lord's face shine upon you. You might have heard uh, during the first lockdown um, the song that was originally written by Elevation Worship called The Blessing. Uh, I remember when UK churches actually did a cover of The Blessing and it was everywhere. I remember getting a text from my mom, a text from my friend, a text from my school teacher. I'm like, I don't even know you're a Christian. Like everyone was talking about this song. And it's just interesting to me that at a time that was really dark for our nation, our prayer was, Lord, shine your face. So the face of God as Cain was speaking to God could be understood as two things, uh, the presence of God and the light of God. It makes sense then why Cain was so afraid and he said, Lord, please do not hide me from your presence. But notice in Adam's response, hiddenness, this, this hiding away from light, this hiding away from presence was also a consequence of his sin. And this leads us to another really important point. This shows us that the plot of the enemy and the consequence of sin is to move us far away from the presence and the person of God. This was the enemy's motive in deceiving the woman, to sow seeds of distrust and unbelief that would ultimately create a, a state of separation between humanity and God. And this also happens today. It's why the biblical prophets would understand sin to be much more than one singular act of wrongdoing, but rather a state of separation, estrangement, and withdrawal from God. Sin was and is a rupture of personal relationship with God. But I've got good news for us, is that God still has a gaze. As we learn, God still looks for us. And I, I don't know who needs to hear this, today, but you might have thought that your past is more powerful than the presence of God, but I'm here to tell you that God has a promise for you, and that promise is that he will seek you, he will find you, and if we repent and turn to him, he will return to us. Your closet secrets are not more powerful than the sweeping brush of God's grace. Your failures are never the final word. I need someone to hear this today because I believe that there might be some people that have found themselves in lockdown, struggling to pray or struggling to even connect with the church. And they try to log into some online services and you kind of, you kind of focus for a minute and then your focus is elsewhere and you're thinking, Lord, what's happening to my faith? And I want to tell you today that God is still looking for you. God still gazes at you. Even though the enemy is trying to separate and make us estranged, the Lord is on the lookout for you. Like church, God has a gaze. But even so, the enemy is still trying. He's still trying to separate us. And, and, and I believe we see this in many ways in our culture today. You see, sin is both personal and social. It's both individual and collective. According to the prophets, sin wasn't just something that happened to one person, but could infect a whole nation. Isaiah 1 verses 4. And among sin's collective forms are things like sexism, racism, nationalism. But the, the form I want to focus on today, which I believe is really prevalent, is the form of secularization. Today, I believe one of the ways the enemy is trying to push us out of God's presence again, push us into hiddenness, is through secularization. Now, for the note takers and the people who are, uh, are not familiar with this term, a good definition of secularization is simply a way of life and thought that is pursued without reference to God or religion. 
Put another way, it means that the church is losing its influence as a shaper of life and thought in a wider social order. Historically, secularization uh, was to do with when a state or government would take some property off of the church, like a school or something. But the form I see of secularization more today is this shifting away from thinking and living in a way that honors God or thinks about God. So this is things like the age of enlightenment. enlightenment. This is things like science's rising power to define meaning. It's things like the breakdown of traditional structures, family, church, neighborhood. It's things like evolution theories and so on. And all of this has contributed to what Max Weber termed the disenchantment of the modern world. Modern world sorry. In other words, the world is tired and bored with God. James Emery White, uh, he, he writes a book called Meet Generation Z. And in it, he talks about the rise of the nuns, uh, the rise of the nuns. Uh, who are the nuns? It's not, um, it's not a Christian nun like N-U-N-S. That, that sounds like a bit of a, a horror film or something. Um, it's nuns spelled N-O-N-E-S. And essentially, the nuns are people who, when asked about their religion or, um, or their faith on surveys or polls, they will simply respond not with Methodist or Baptist or Anglican or a religion. They will simply tick the box uh, that says nothing, none, no religion. Uh, and James Emery White talks about um, a, a 2015 British survey, a, a election survey that was done. And he speaks about the rise of these nuns because in 1963, the people who would tick no religion was only 3% of people. But when they surveyed uh, 20,000 people, they found that this number of 3% had risen to 44.7% today, nearly half of the population. And so this rise of secularization is happening so quick in our culture. This trend is so profound that a two-year commission involving various religious leaders of all faiths has called for public life, uh, for, sorry, for faith life in Britain to be systematically de-Christianized. In other words, they're saying Britain is no longer a Christian nation. So Let's just stop treating it like it is. So the question is, is Christianity failing? Well, not really, actually. It, it, in, in the southern um, nations, in the southern part of the world, actually, there's been a rise uh, in Christianity uh, in the global south. And actually, Christianity remains the world's largest faith, um, even on studies that stretch to 2050. So Christianity is actually rising in the global south, but in the Western region, in the UK and places like here, we're seeing secularization. We're seeing the enemy push this agenda of separation. Once upon a time, all of the intellects, uh, intellectuals, sorry, and all of the artists and all the creatives were actually people of faith. You think of Leonardo da Vinci, you think of all these people who would paint in, uh, incredible things and make incredible artwork for the name of God. Today, that's on decline. So what are we to do? Are we just to mourn the past? Are we trying to achieve some type of cultural revolution again? Are we just to sit here confused and sad with what to do? I believe, like church, as I close, that the situation that we see ourselves in is solvable. Beyond that, it's actually something that I believe will be transformed, will be redeemed. And I believe it's going to be redeemed by us returning to the face of God. You see, Adam and Eve, they, they thought that the, the response to sin was to clothe themselves with fig leaves and turn away from God and be hidden. Cain was so fearful that he would be hidden from the, the presence and the light of God's face. And the enemy is still trying to push this agenda of separation. Separation. 
But I believe, like church, that in this time, in a, such a time as this, in this generation, that God is looking for a people who are going to turn back to his presence, a people that are going to turn back to the light of his face and be glorious, shining lamps in a dark, dark world. I want to share a really quick quote with you that helped me to know what the, the, the commission is, I guess, of the church today. A guy called Will Willman, what a good name, <laughs> he wrote this. The most eloquent testimony of the reality of the resurrection is not an empty tomb or a well-orchestrated Easter Sunday service, but rather a group of people whose life together is so radically different, so completely changed from the way that the world builds community that there can be no other explanation than something decisive has happened in history. John Tyson wrote this, in these challenging and demanding times, we shouldn't be trying to seek control or even abandon the world, but rather we're trying to, we should be trying to love it into a new life through redemptive participation. We need a vision that is not based on a fear of a godless future or a longing for an idolized past, but rather we need a rich presence in our own time that inspires beauty and the possibility of a new vision for Christ church. So what our role here in this time, like church, is to be a compelling alternative. We've seen what God does for us. He seeks us. We've seen what sin does. It, it makes us want to hide in places. We've seen how sin develops over time and how it's led to secularization and, and this rise of the nuns. But now the call is that we would be a compelling alternative. This is why I love what's happening with Light Church and, and the hashtag More Than Sundays campaign. Because it's not just about a building. It's not just about having some bricks and mortar. It's actually about being a compelling alternative. It's about being a light in today's culture. It's about changing the conversation and not allowing those people that say, hey, you can't talk about religion and politics today. It's about us being a light. It's about us changing this idea of the sacred secular divide and us going into the music industries, us going into the creative industries, us being uh, homeschooling parents, but doing it in a way that is so godly and so different that it causes our neighbors and our friends to say, what is it that is different about you? You may have been experiencing sin pushing you into a corner but I'm calling you back out God is calling you back out he's saying I'm gazing at you and I want my light to shine upon you that you would be a candle that cannot be hidden a city on a hill that cannot be hidden this is the call light church as I as I come to an end it is my prayer it's my plea that we would respond Hey, maybe you, you've been listening to this and actually you're not even part of the church yet. Or maybe you have been part of the church, but you feel that your faith has maybe slipped away somehow. Maybe you've been listening to this and, and you're in cane shoes. You're, you're fearful that you've been hidden from God's presence, from his light. Well, I want to give you an offer today. I want to ask you to respond to this message. To, to come back to the light and to the presence of God's face. And so as I close and as I end now, I'm just going to invite us into prayer. And if you're in that category where you're far from God, or perhaps you just feel like this, there's been some leakage in, in, leaking sorry, in your faith, then I want to invite you to pray with me. I'm going to say a few words really really simple words and if you feel in your heart that this message is connected with you and you want to turn to God again then I would invite you to pray with me let us pray Father thank you thank you that you look for me thank you that you sent your son to die for me and Lord, 
I ask for your forgiveness. I want to come back to your presence. Please would you forgive my sins. And Lord, would you now help me to live for you, to live in your presence and to be your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, I'm going to pass back to you all at Light Church, but it's been a privilege and an honor. And we here in East London are partnering with you guys at Light Church. We are standing to be a compelling alternative in today's culture. Hey, God bless you guys. Take care and hopefully see you soon. Hey, if you made that decision this morning to cross that line of faith, or maybe you're interested in making that step, walking in a relationship with Jesus, then I want to invite you to email us at hello at light.church because we want to chat to you, we want to equip you, we want to resource you for what's ahead. And this is done better in community. And we want to send you a Bible. So please, please contact us at hello at light.church because you're not meant to do this alone. Hey, Tammy, we want to thank you so much for bringing that incredible message. We appreciate you. We love you. And church, if you're still on the live chat, can we show Tammy some love? Um, you can send him an emoji or whatever. But thank you so much for bringing that. But before we go on, just some dates for your diary. I just want to remind you that next Sunday, we're going to be doing communion together. So that means you need to have some bread, some wine, some juice, whatever it is, ready for next Sunday, because we are going to do communion together. We'll send out an email. We'll keep you in the loop, whatever. But please have it ready. Do not miss out. Yeah, and like we said at the beginning of the virtual gathering, make sure if you haven't connected with us yet that you head to light.church forward slash connect and fill out that form. And this is for anyone who has not connected with us yet or you're not receiving any emails from us because like Daniel said, we're going to be sending out an email, a reminder about communion, and we've got some other exciting stuff dropping via email next week that is more of what's going on at Light Church, is more of what's happening than just here in the virtual gathering. So please, 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 if you're not receiving emails from us right now, then I'm speaking to you. Head to light.church forward slash connect and fill out that form because we really want to connect you in with everything that we've got going on, everything that's not here um, on YouTube. There's so much going on that I don't want you to miss out on. So please, please head there and fill that form out. Oh, I think I'm going to emphasize it enough that we <laughs> want you to be part of what we've got going on. <laughs> Okay, so we showed our More Than Sundays video just before the message. We've had some incredible feedback. Can I encourage you? We have raised just over 20,000 pounds already in the last couple of weeks. So look, your part in this, when you keep sharing it, when you keep commenting, engaging with it, sending it to your friends, sending the website, www.light.church forward slash more than Sundays. The more we share, the more people are gonna get involved in this. And I, can I encourage you already? It has been amazing to see the feedback. So don't underestimate what a share or a comment or whatever might do. So keep going. I really believe that if we keep praying, we keep committing this to God, we will see something special. Yeah, it's been incredible so far. And the fun doesn't stop here, guys. If you want to join us for our After Gathering Zoom, then the Zoom link details are going to be in the, the description, in the chat, wherever right now. And you can click on there and join um, me, myself. I'll be there at the After Gathering Zoom. And we just have a good time catching up with one another. You can stay for five minutes. You can stay for the full half an hour, whatever you want to do. But it's just a great opportunity to catch up with people that maybe you've not seen in a while. Hey, we've absolutely loved being with you this morning on our virtual gathering. We absolutely love these virtual gatherings. And uh, I just want to encourage you to like this video, to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on anything. Also, we are on socials too. So you can follow us on Instagram. You can uh, be a friend or follow us on Facebook, whatever it is. Um, but other than that, that is everything from us. Yeah, it is. We hope to see you next week. But remember, if you've not connected, get connected. Oh, yeah. See you next week. <laughs> Bye.